okay. Let me give you a little a, a new version for you and then um, we're going to sing it together, right? I'm not a very good singer but we're going to try. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday to you! Sing VCC! Happy birthday to you! Okay, we're going to try that. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday to you, Missy! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday to you, Missy! Happy birthday to you! One more time! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday to you, Missy! Happy birthday to you! Can you stand to your feet, everybody? We're going to say it one more time. A big one. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy I've listened to enough people preach from the book of Revelation and thought that 
A lot of what they had to say bear no relevance with the reality of the revelation of God. And I thought, well, let's, let's leave revelation to when Jesus comes and he reveals the true nature of the book itself. But today I believe the Lord has asked me to look again and to bring to your attention Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. As we think about the theme for this weekend, overcoming obstacle and living victorious lives. I'm sure that many of you have come today longing for God to intervene and to remove some obstacle in your life. And rightly so. Now, I constantly make an error of not introducing my wife and say, this is my wife Sharon and my son Mark Anthony. I just get into things. But please forgive me again. <laughs> But the reality is that living a victorious life is not an option for the believer. Living a victorious life is a prerequisite as part of our faith. And it's important to recognize that the greatest obstacle that humanity has faced has already been overcome. Hello? Hello? The obstacle of sin, the guilt and the shame of sin has been overcome by the cruel death of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It has been overcome by the burial, the shameful and the, and the burial of Jesus and his triumphant resurrection. Yeah. Jesus Christ has overcome and because he has overcome we have already overcome. Hallelujah. Hello? Hallelujah. We can, if we choose to be reconciled with Christ, be on the winning side. Hello? Hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's going somewhere. He's going somewhere. So in a sense, our personal victory, the victory of those, of our families and those who come under the covering that we have, has already been secured. Hello? That is why the prophet Isaiah reminds us that no weapon that is formed against us is going to prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us, what does it say? I thought so. It says, you shall condemn. Hello? It's not going to happen automatically, but you shall condemn what rises up against you. Have you not known? Have you not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faint nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you not heard? Have you not been told? Do you not know? That's why in Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 13 verses 5 it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do? If there is an obstacle 
in your life today, there is a point in which you have to declare, I have heard, I do know that my obstacles are removed and is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. I, am, I do know that God has set aside the spirit of fear so that I can boldly go, so that I can confront, so that I can achieve all the things that God has in store for me as a person. That was somebody. But we can go on and on and on. But that is not my focus today. Today I want to focus on an overcoming church. I've been to quite a few churches. I've met quite a few pastors and churches. And I've seen a lot of congregations. And, I, and I've concluded that successful people do not make a successful church. Let's try that again. Successful people do not make a successful church. Successful church grows successful people. Hello? And I use those words, successful, in quotations. Because success is not measured by earthly standards. It is measured by how God evaluates compliance with his word, compliance with his purposes, and compliance with his will. Let me explain. Throughout antiquity, from the time we come into contact with scripture, from the Old Testament to the New, there is always a desire for God to make his name known to the cities and the nations in which his people dwell. Is that all right? That has always been God's desire. Today, God still needs places where his name would be declared as a beacon and as a lighthouse for the societies and the communities in which we live. Hello? He is still looking for opportunities to demonstrate his glory, his majesty, his dominion, his power, and his authority. Working through the individual is something that God does. But working through the individual has the, the challenge of the individual taking their gifts and their calling as a private possession. Hello? Hello. I would get nervous if you ask me. There is a danger of exalting self and taking credit for everything that God does when he does it to an individual. But the church is recognized as the place that represents God and all that he stands for. Long after individuals come and individuals go, the church always remains. Almost always. Is that all right? So when we look to scripture, scripture has much to say to us. Contrary to popular opinion, mine included, because if you hear me in another context, I might be saying something very different. But this word is for you as a church today, and so it takes the direction for which it goes. Contrary to popular opinion, the church remains the best expression of Christ. Hello? Best expression of Christ, Christ wants to see his church reflect his radiance, reflect his passion, reflect his love, reflects the things he hates, and embraces the things he loves. Hello? And I feel deep in my heart today that God demands that this church be its name. Victorious in experience and victorious in demonstration. Can I read 
I'm suggesting that God demands that this church be its name. Victorious in experience and victorious in demonstration. Being a victorious and an overcoming church is not based on the leadership team assessment of their performance. Whether those performances are measured against set objectives and those things are important, but that's not what makes the church victorious. Making a church victorious is not about how members feel things are going for them and their family and how responsive the church is to their needs. Although this is an integral responsibility of the church. It should not be based on the reports of over-demanding individuals who shows a tantrum every time they don't get their own way. I know you don't have any of those here. Neither should it be based on how the community and local institutions feels although their perception is important. The criterion must rest solely on the verdict of God himself. Amen. And God's mirror will always give the best and the truest reflection of who we are. Hello? I don't know if you've heard the story about the monkey in the mirror. But there's a little fable about the monkey saw a mirror and looked in it and felt what he saw in the mirror was so ugly and revolting, he smashed the mirror. And our society is like that today. That if the church holds up the testimony of the cross of Jesus Christ, the word of God, in actual fact, it wants to smash the reflection that shows them for who they are and who we are as individuals. The mirror of the word of God exposes our behaviors, our action, and the sin we commit on a daily basis. The response to it is not to tear the word, but to repent. Hello? The scripture brings to us a challenge. The Bible says the word of God is an offense. And in our society, what we're seeking to do is to remove the offense. And that is why faith is compromised and set aside. But God is challenging us to hold that mirror up and not to let it go. Are you still with me? Yes. So we look to Revelation. Sorry. We look to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 in which we see God is having a look at seven churches. And if you've been to church longer than the two weeks or so, you would have heard at some point that when the Bible talks about the word seven, it is talking about the completeness of things. God does have things in order of sevens which shows the completeness. And the suggestion is that I would say that these seven churches is typical of any church you'd like me to find. Find a church, you'll find them in one of these seven churches. Some may be a mixture of both, but of, of one or two, but you will find those churches there. So I've got good and bad news for you. If you really want to see where your church is, have a look in Revelation chapter 2 and measure it. And then we will see. But there's a specific challenge that comes with this, with Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. 
God declares himself as being the one who has in control the angels of the churches. Now, that is something of interest to me. It's of interest because it is suggesting that for every congregation, God has put a seal. God has put some form of protection, some form of guidance, some form of direction for which the church must go. And what needs to happen within that church is sent by his spirit and sent by his angels. And so the apostle John, as he was looking to God, God said to him, I want you to write down exactly what I'm saying and send it not to the churches, but to the angels of these churches. If God is talking to John and he has the angels in his right hand, they are right there with him, then the angel would understand what God is saying to the churches, wouldn't they? It seems obvious. If I'm standing next to you and I'm talking to my wife, you would hear exactly the conversation I'm saying. However, when it is written and given to the churches, it means that this has now become the edict of God. These are the only instructions that you are allowed to carry out on my behalf. Hello? Hello, sir. Now, when we look at these churches in greater detail, there is something interesting. If we start with the church in Ephesus, it was located in one of the greatest cities in the ancient, ancient world, and it was famous for its temples and the worship of Diana, the goddess or the patron of prostitutes, fertility, and sexuality. It also became famous for the Roman emperors who existed. It had a good and bad. It was a fortress for people who were convicted of a crime and they could go to Ephesus and they were safe. Generosity was exploited and people used to go to Ephesus in order to form gangs. And they had their own mafia where they determined what crime they would commit. That was at the heart of Ephesus. They had their reputation for being magicians and having several cultural norms. Does that bear any resemblance of places you know? Hello? You can talk to me. We also have the church in Smyrna. It was a seaport, it was very prosperous. But again, it built temples to allow pagan and Roman worship. And although it was destroyed, it was also rebuilt. We have the church in Pergamon. And it was a center of religious life. Many temples. It was devoted to the art of making parchment and it had libraries of over 200 books. And it was famous for the temples and the gods of healing. And it was the first temple that was dedicated to Augustus and Rome. And it took on the kind of sense of we are a religious society, we are an educated society, and we are a society with great political affiliations. Hello? There are times when we think about the ancient cities, we think about them as just places that have been. But in fact, the more you dive into these cities, they were no different in their time than in the city in which we live here today. Hello? Britain is the fourth, fourth most industrial nation in the world. And it would take a special church to make an impact in the fourth most developed nation of the world. Hello? Hello? 
with its sophistication, with its ways of doing things, we have to find a way of being Christ in the presence of the most sophisticated people you can find, as we would like to think. Hello? Hello. And then there's the church in Tyre. And this one was a mere craft city, a merchant city. It produced the best clothes, the best purple and dyes. But it also worshipped the sun god. And then we have Sardis. They had a reputation and became prosperous in textile and manufacturing and jewelry making. Its wealthy citizens took on the mystery cults such as Celebe, the God of Victory, and the cult of Diana. But also, it was seen as a fortress where no one could invade, despite it being invaded more than five times. The, the Proverbs would say, if you can invade Sardis, you would have invaded anywhere else. It was like doing the impossible. But we also have Philadelphia. It was a place that suffered from earthquakes. And its defenses was constantly breached because it could not protect itself. And people decided that they were going to live in the countryside rather than in the city. And finally, we have the Laodicea Church, very wealthy. It was a banking center and manufactured clothes and carpets. It even had, in those days, a medical school. And it produced medicines for its neighbors. So these churches were sophisticated in sophisticated cities. And then God comes to them to have a word. Hello? Hello, sir. For each of the cities, God introduced himself very differently. To, to the church in Ephesus, he said, I know your works. In every single one of the churches, God starts out by saying, I know your works. Hello? If God knows your works, it means that God is keeping tabs and he's keeping an eye on what is happening. Hello? Hello. Talk to the person next to you, he's going somewhere. God is still in control whether you believe it or not, of what is happening in our world and in our churches. Hello? And God wants us to know that he has a view on what is happening in our church. And if you're going to be an overcoming church, then it's worth taking in mind the view that God has. Hear what he says to the church in Ephesus. I know your works, your labor, and your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Isn't that great? God understands all the good works that they are doing. But then he comes and says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. But while you were busy doing stuff for you, we labor, we endure, 